flip on over to Mark chapter 14 as we continue our conversation through the life and ministry of Jesus. This is the point in Jesus' ministry that the ancient Hebrews would refer to as Passover week. This is when they gather together from all over the known world, those that worship the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, uh, to go through just the Passover uh, ceremonial things that they would do, sacrifices, offerings, Passover seders and meals. Like this was just a part of what they would do this time of year. But for those of us that are now Christians, we're on the other side of the resurrection and we trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We think about this more in terms of the Passion Week because we know what's coming. We recognize the suffering that Jesus was going to experience on our behalf as he willingly gave himself up for us on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven because of the blood that was poured out in his sacrifice. And look, Jesus could have pulled himself off the cross. He could have called down 10,000 legions of angels and just shocked everybody and then be like, oh yeah, that's definitely God there hanging on the cross. But he willingly humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross, Philippians chapter two. Because we needed a rescuer, a redeemer. You and I could not afford to pay for the sins that we had committed and were going to commit. We needed a, a pure offering, an unblemished lamb to pay the price of all of our sins. And Jesus became that lamb for us. So he willingly went to the cross. There was no stopping him. This is why he showed up. But that's a couple of days from now in the story where we're at. And it still seems mysterious to the disciples that Jesus keeps alluding to his death because up until this point, quite frankly, he's just continued to escalate in his popularity with the people. It was just a few days before they were all shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 2.7 million people just in awe of Jesus and really believing that it was God that had arrived. The promised one of the prophets was finally here. But in our conversation today, we see where the narrative starts to change, where conversations start to happen behind the scenes and a strategy is put into place to try to send Jesus to his ultimate execution. It's packaged in a really sweet moment where we're going to get to see a lady offer an offering of worship unlike we have seen in the entire book of Mark. But let's pick up in Mark chapter 14 and see what's going on as we continue to build on the story of the life and ministry of Jesus so we can know who he truly is why he truly came and what he has truly done for us. Chapter 14, verse one says, it was now about two days before the Passover and it was the feast of unleavened bread and the chief priests and the scribes, they were sneaking around whispering and they were seeking how to arrest him. Who's him? Jesus, yeah, best Sunday school answer right there. They were seeking how to arrest him, Jesus, by stealth or some of your Bibles may say by treachery. They were trying to sneakily, stealthily, treacherously arrest Jesus where nobody saw it and they wanted to what? Kill him. For they said, Let, let's don't do it during the feast lest there be an uproar from the people because Jesus was still too popular with the people. They didn't want this to be a public display. Now fast forward a handful of verses and jump to verse 10. Not only are the religious leaders of the day, the religious leaders who claim to know God, to know his word, and yet they had God show up right in front of their face and they didn't even recognize it. As they're setting out to kill him, we fast forward to verse 10, let's get a look at one of Jesus' closest friends. In verse 10 it says, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, one of the 12 original disciples of Jesus, went to the chief priests in order to betray him, Jesus, to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and they promised to give him a pile of money and he sought an opportunity to betray him. Look at the sandwich right there. When we see sandwiches like that, we're supposed to pay attention not only to this, the bread of the sandwich, but what Mark's trying to draw us to. I talked about this before. When he sandwiches stuff, he wants us to really focus on what's in the middle, the meat of the matter. And we've just seen the religious leaders of the day are seeking to kill him. One of his closest friends is putting together a strategy to betray him. And then we see this sweet moment in verse 3 of chapter 14. And while Jesus was at Bethany, he was in the house of Simon the who? Yeah, this Simon had been a leper, but guess who just so happened to miraculously heal him from leprosy so that he could actually have a dinner party at his house? 
Jesus. Yeah, yeah, lepers didn't host dinner parties. Simon had been known as a leper, but had been miraculously healed by Jesus and was no longer a leper. He was a walking miracle. And as he, Jesus, was reclining at the table at Simon, the used to be leper's house, a woman came in with an alabaster flask of ointment, a pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask. She snapped the neck off of it and just poured the whole thing on Jesus' head, and as it trickled down his body all the way to his feet and to the floor, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, wait, why was that ointment wasted? Say wasted. Why would you waste an ointment like that? For the ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. According to the book of John, that also tells this story and just gives us some other details, the one who is piping up on behalf of how everybody else felt just so happened to be who we read about in verse 10, old Judas himself. Man, I wish you would have sold that oil. We could have made 300 denarii off of that. Judas being Jesus' accountant who always carried the money bag, oh, he definitely wanted to have a money bag with 300 denarii in it. He had other plans with that. But she poured it all out on Jesus. The group at large, they just saw this as a waste. They began to scold her for doing that. And Jesus says in verse 6, leave her alone. Why would you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing. Say beautiful thing. She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can go do good for them. They knew that was the expectation on the life of the believer. But you will not always have me, Jesus says. Don't miss this opportunity. This is God in the flesh here. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, when she, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Right in between the religious leaders trying to kill him and one of his closest friends trying to betray him, we see a changed life seeking to worship him in a way that we have not seen in the entire book of Mark. Let me just call the roll real quick so we know who all standing in the room when this went down. Jesus is at the house of Simon the who? So we've got Simon who formerly was a leper until who just so happened to heal him from his leprosy so he can host the dinner party? Jesus. All right, so we've got all 12 of the original disciples. We've got a guy named Simon who was miraculously healed from leprosy. We've also got, according to the book of John, if you read John chapter 12, you'll also learn that there are other people in the room, including Mary and Martha. Oh, and this one guy named Lazarus, who Jesus also had just happened to heal from the dead and bring him out of, from the dead four days after he died. The, they're all in the room together. Th- this, is, this is the attendance role on the night that this would have went down. And then someone walks in with an alabaster flask. Uh, some believe that this was Mary, Martha's sister. Some believe that because there's so many similarities to the account in Luke chapter 7 and 8, that this might have been Mary Magdalene who actually walked in and broke the alabaster flask. And she came into this dinner party. It's not too far of a stretch to believe this could have been Mary Magdalene because after Jesus had healed her from seven demons and after Jesus had forgiven her sin from living what is believed to be an incredibly promiscuous and insane lifestyle, her and some of her closest friends, they continued to follow Jesus and the disciples, Mary Magdalene, and serve them and meet their needs and help fund and resource the ministry of the gospel. So it would not be uncommon that in this particular point in the story of Jesus' life that Mary Magdalene, in a very broken state, may have walked in with the most expensive thing that she had to bring an offering of worship to Jesus. Whether it was her, the sister of Martha, we're not totally sure, but I do know this. Whoever it was, they gave an offering of worship unlike we had seen in the entire book of Mark, And did you notice what everybody else in the room did when they saw this unprecedented moment of worship? They joined in the chorus, right? They also went back and and grabbed their most expensive thing that they had to come bring as an offering of worship to the Lord. No, they jeered at her. They criticized her. They told her, this is, what are you doing? What 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 are you doing pouring all of that out on him? And then in the... And the language that they speak, that, that word that they use to rebuke her harshly literally means they were snorting like angry horses. They were just incensed at the idea that she would do something like that. 
to give us a little idea of what in the world's happening in the story, like understand that this vial that she had, that 300 denarii, this, this would have been so expensive in their time and their culture that she probably never bought this. This was so exclusive. It was probably a family heirloom. Like this is, this is something that you don't just ever pour out. Like you may take a dab here and there for very exclusive and important moments in your life. But when you do the math, like that 300 denarii in their time equates to about $35,000 in our time. That's how much that bottle of cologne was worth. You don't just pour that out. You know what I'm saying? Like a little spritz here and there at the most exclusive moments in your life. But no, she comes in and she snaps the neck off of that thing and she just pours it all over Jesus, anointing his body with this incredibly exclusive perfume. John goes on to tell us she took it a step further. Like his people had just come into dinner that night. All right, one of the things that would have had to have happened before everybody sits down at the table is the lowest of the low servant would have grabbed a cloth and a basin of water and washed everybody's disgusting feet before they sat at the table. But when it was time to wash Jesus' feet, she didn't pick up the old dirty rag that everybody else was using. She didn't even go grab a new one out of the linen cloths that she According to the book of John, John chapter 12, verse 3, she actually let down her hair, got on her knees, and while the oil was dripping on Jesus' feet, she took her hair and she washed his feet with her hair. It's a stunning moment of worship, one that even we could relate to. Ladies, I know some of y'all care about your hair. But I can promise you, you don't care about your hair as much as she cared about her hair. Because in her hair, in ancient Hebrew culture, her hair would have been a symbol of her glory. Like this this was a status symbol for her. And for her to take the very thing that was her glory in her ancient culture, not only to pour out the best offering she had, but to let her hair down and get on her knees and take the most glorious thing she had was her long locks of hair and wash the filthy feet of Jesus. Hey, I know he's God, all right, but I mean, he'd been walking through town all day wearing sandals like everybody else. Like there is grime and gunk under his toenails and in between his toes. It's probably bloody dry blood on it from where he stubbed his toe against a rock. This was an inglorious moment. And she took a $35,000 vial of perfume and she poured it on Jesus and then she washed his feet with her hair, with her glory. Just to summarize that for us, listen, her personal glory was worth less to her than the dirt that was on Jesus' feet. Let me say that another way. The very best parts of her, she considered lesser than the worst parts of Jesus. Oh, what extravagant worship we get to see in the life of this lady. What extraordinary love. This wasn't a woman who just had an infatuation with a celebrity. This is a woman that had been rescued and redeemed by the Savior that she would be willing to lay down everything she's got and everything she is and everything she stands for for the sake of worshiping him and bringing him glory despite the fact that everybody else in the room that should have been joining in the chorus criticized her the whole time she was doing it. What an act of worship that was. (laughs) This moment kind of asks a question of us too, like is, hey, um, Hey, hey, Grace Bible, what is your glory? You know, what, what is the thing that you hold in highest regard in your life? What, what is the thing that in so many ways just kind of like defines who you are? You, you know what I'm saying? Like that thing that it's always kind of at the forefront of your mind and your heart that oftentimes like there's a temptation in conversations, especially with new people, to kind of lead out with that thing. Because you just believe that it's the dye that has been cast that colors everything that you are as a person. And so you just kind of like, you want them to know, you kind of want to lead out with it. You're kind of interested in how they feel about it. That's your glory. That's the thing that just labels you, whether it should or not, that's the thing. Is 
Is it your education? Is it your business name? Is it your family name? Is it something you've accomplished in your life? Is it some experience you have? Is it something that you believe? Like what's the thing that colors everything that you are? And oh yeah, by the way, it doesn't necessarily have to be a good thing, kind of like Mary. That, that bottle of oil may very much have been a representation of the promiscuous life that she was coming from. That may not necessarily been something that she was proud of. It was a symbol of who she was before coming to Jesus. So why not give it all to him? And I'm wondering if anybody rolled up in here this morning, and frankly, your glory, the thing that kind of colors all of who you are is not something you're proud of, but it's some tragedy you experienced or some trauma that you have in your life or some hardship that you've struggled with or some past guilt or shame that you're dealing with. Like what, what, what's your glory? What's the thing that kind of colors all that you are, that it's at the forefront of who you are and whether you want to tell people or not about it, like you're wondering how they would feel if they knew about it, like your glory, what is it? Well, for this girl, this girl named Mary, she believed the good, the bad, and the ugly, the most significant parts of who she were and who who she was, was the very thing that she was going to bring to worship Jesus, good, bad, and ugly. I wonder, do I consider the most substantial parts of me to be of lesser value than serving Jesus, no matter the insignificance or no matter how dirty it's going to be. I'll tell you what, Mary did, but the rest of the people in the room didn't, which is actually probably the, one of the most stunning parts of this whole story because I just, I just read off the attendance sheet for who was in the room that day. Here standing in the room, criticizing her and demeaning her while she washes the feet of Jesus with her hair in this incredibly expensive bottle or perfume are 12 disciples, Jesus' closest friends, who not only had Jesus rescued out of their lives, but he had also commanded the wind and the waves to stop when they were on a boat one night. He had also provided enough food for about 15,000 people with just a few loaves and a couple of fish. He had also caused the blind to see in their presence He had also caused the deaf to hear in their presence. He had also caused the lame to walk in their presence. They were also standing outside the tomb when Jesus called out to Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come out. And now Lazarus is standing in the house and the disciples can see the resurrected Lazarus. Resurrected Lazarus is in the group criticizing the woman. Oh yeah, and Simon the leper too. Every one of them should have hit their face and joined in the worship song of pouring out their lives before Jesus. But only she did. And everyone else criticized and demeaned her. Oh, and by the way, they weren't just demeaning Mary. They were demeaning Jesus. Did you notice what they said when she poured all that oil out on Jesus? In verse 4, Mary, what are you doing? Why would you, what's the word? Waste it. Waste it. Is there anything too much that he is not worthy? Is there anything that we could possibly give that would ever be a waste. These are the ones that saw Jesus perform extraordinary miracles. Some of these people were the miracle. They're standing in a room and they say, what a waste. You know, it's funny, like here in the Christian world, like some people, some people truly do give all that they are and all that they have to Jesus. But many people who would consider themselves to be Christian, they just give some of who they are. I get it. 
We struggle with selfishness. We try to preserve certain things for ourselves. We only, we only want to worship God so much because, man, we feel like the more we give to God, the more it's going to cost us, and that's scary. So some people truly give all in their life to Jesus, and some only give some. But what is one of the great ironies in the body of Christ is that it's the people who only give some that are the most critical of the people who gave all. It should be the other way around, shouldn't it? You would think that the people who gave all would be critical of the people who gave some, but you see, part of giving all is also giving up yourself and your rights, so there's no space in your heart to be critical of anyone else's gift. But you know what's funny about just giving some is there's plenty of selfishness still rooted in there that, oh, we get critical real fast of those who give all. They're freaks to us, like weirdos, like, that's a waste to pour out that kind of offering on Jesus. Like, man. No one in the church has a problem with moderate, measured devotion to Christ. That's comfortable. No one really has a problem with anyone having too many personal possessions or trying to find the pursuit of comfortable, convenient Christianity, but man, give up a real career and go into the mission field. Come on, man. What a waste. Man, waste that kind of leadership talent and walk out of the corporate world to pastor a church or man, squander that top shelf education that you got to commit your life to ministry. Man, what a waste. What a waste, man. You can do so much more with your life. I want you to just volunteer from time to time, but you've got real gifts, real abilities. And what a waste for you to pour it all out, all out on Jesus. That's what was happening there with her. I bet that's what's happening in here some today too. Now, regardless of how you feel about her gift to Jesus, regardless of how they felt about her gift to Jesus, This is how Jesus felt about the gift of worship that she gave. And Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing. Say beautiful thing. She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can go do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could, literally what she could. Everything that she had. She gave, and she has anointed my body beforehand for burial. That stuck out to Jesus as much as the offering of worship and the washing of the feet with the hair because the disciples had heard Jesus talk a countless amount of times about him preparing to go give give up his life for our sake, that he would be crucified, delivered into the hands of men to be executed like a criminal. And the disciples still were just dumbfounded by that. They're still scratching their head thinking, I don't know about that, Jesus. Like, seriously, everything's going really good. What do you mean? Listen, Mary didn't understand it any more than the rest of the disciples did. And quite frankly, she would have heard him speak about it a lot less than she heard the disciples did, than the disciples had heard it. But the reality of it was, is Jesus said it, so she believed it. And she was going to act on it. And this was her way of saying, Jesus, if you say you're about to die, then I'm going to leave nothing unsaid and nothing undone and no offering ungiven. I'm going to pour it all out right now. And so she did. Her whole self and everything that she had to give. And Jesus says that it was beautiful. Beautiful. You know why Jesus, this is the first time we see Jesus call, people had been worshiping Jesus. There was 2.7 million people less than a week before that was shouting Hosanna, like just in awe of him and throwing their cloaks on the ground, waving their palm branches. Jesus never responded like, wow, that's beautiful. Man, a sea of faces. This is the first time we see Jesus respond like this to an offering of worship. And you know why, why Jesus was so moved by this particular one, unlike any other offering of worship in all the scriptures? This was a Holy Spirit-inspired act of worship that was not dominated by practicality. Y'all chew on that for just a sec. 
maybe the first one Jesus has seen his whole ministry. I don't know, but he called this one beautiful because this was a Holy Spirit-inspired act of worship that was not dominated by practicality. In other words, let me ask you a question. Is it truly worship? When the offering we plan to give to the Lord first has to die the death of a thousand qualifications and whatever's left at the end of the funnel after we decide what qualifications that worship needs to meet, whatever's left, that's what we give to the Lord. Is that, is that really worship? When what we plan to give to the Lord first has to meet certain criteria and check certain boxes, and I gotta make sure I feel comfortable with it first, and I gotta make sure the people around me feel comfortable with it because I don't wanna be treated like Mary was. And I gotta make sure it's not too loud, but not too soft. I want people to know that I'm doing it, but I also wanna, want it to be seen as like humble, so I don't want too many people to know, or I'll have somebody else brag on me for me, so I don't have to like humble brag or anything. After our offering of worship to God, whatever that may be, has died on the hill of all these qualifications, what's left at the end of that? Is that even really worship at all? It seems to me that what we worship is everything in between. It seems to me what we bow our heart towards is all the qualifications and the fears of those qualifications and what people might think and what we might think and how this is gonna affect our 401k. And so you know what? After we have bowed and worshiped all of those gods, whatever's left, we hand to the king of heaven and earth. Is that worship? Is that worship at all? This lady's offering didn't pass through any filter of worship. She gave all that she could, Jesus said. Everything she had and everything that she was got laid at his feet that day. It reminds me of the time in 2 Samuel chapter 6 when King David, when David, he was dancing, dancing wildly before the Lord. And King Saul's daughter saw it happen and came up to David and said, Whoa, David, you got to chill out, man. Like you, you got clout and status around here. You can't just be acting crazy like that. And David's response to her, 2 Samuel 6, he says, I'll become even more undignified than this. In other words, I'm holding some back for y'all's sake, but I've got more in the tank. I mean, that's what worship looks like, man. That's what Mary's worship looked like that day. And the offering itself was beautiful and unchecked by any other qualification, but the fact that she continued to offer it despite the mounting criticism of religious, godly people around her. <laughs> what an offering it was indeed. What an offering it was. This extravagant act of worship, Jesus said in verse 9, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. There's something, something powerful about real, authentic worship before the Lord, giving of ourselves completely over to him. It, it, it allows the world and the people of, around us to see the worthiness of Jesus. Seriously, worship like David, worship like Mary, it allowed everybody in that room to see the worthiness of Jesus in a way that they had not seen it before. There's something powerful about the impacts and the echo impacts of worship, just the resonating effect of the world to the world around us. And hey, uh, I wonder as the outside world looks in on the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century of America, I wonder how our worship displays the worthiness of Jesus. I wonder what they see. I wonder how worthy they think he really is. Based on our whatever's left over, die the death of a thousand qualifications kind of worship. I wonder. And so I think this passage leaves us with a question that every one of those disciples was going to have to answer in the coming days. And every one of us has to answer in this lifetime is how worthy is Jesus? 
Let me, let me ask that another way. Let me go to layman's terms here. How much of your worship is Jesus worth? How about that? How much of our worship is Jesus worth? A few songs on a Sunday? Hey, hey. Oh, it's settled in heaven, Lord, so it's settled with me. Ooh, I like that song, especially with Natalie singing, Lord. Man, I know how to worship real good when she's singing. What, what's, he, what, what, what's he worth? How worthy is he? A few songs on a Sunday. <laughs> is that the best offering we have to give? What about that big decision you have to make this week? Is he worthy of that? Is he worthy to be the king of that? What about that sin you keep stepping right back into? Not struggling with it, just willingly going back to it. Is he worthy of that? What about that guilt you carried in here with you this morning? That shame, that life story of inglorious glory that you wear like the hair of Mary and just wonder what people might think if they found out. I wonder, is he worthy of that? He wants that too. <laughs> he loved her worship, knowing where it came from, made it all the more sweet. I wonder, is he worthy of your life? Is he worthy of everything that you are and everything that you have? A very small percentage of you, very small, who truly surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord and King of your life, a very small percentage of you will be asked by God to relocate your family to some foreign country somewhere to do mission work. Very small. But I can tell you what's going to happen to everybody who surrenders like that, who's willing to lay it all down like that. The Lord may not relocate you at all. He may not change anything about your life. He might have you exactly where he wants you right now. He's just waiting to change your mind about how you see where he has you right now. And when you come to a place of total and complete surrender, all of a sudden, all those things that you saw as who, marked who you are, your accomplishments, your business, your family, your neighborhood, your relationships, your whatever. You're not going to see those as banners to wave to bring yourself glory because you're going to lay that glory down at the feet of Jesus. You're going to start to see those as places to meet with Jesus for the sake of his mission and his purpose. That's the mission he may call you to. The question is, though, how worthy is Jesus to you? Let's pray. God, I've, I'm overwhelmed with just conviction of my own. And Lord, I, I want my life and mine and Ansley's story to glorify you all the days of our life. That we would live submitted to you. That you would be the king of every decision we make that our ears would be attuned to you, Father, that every alabaster flask that we get, we would snap the neck off of it and just pour it all over the feet of Jesus. That we would lay our crowns at your feet, that, Lord, have your way in me and Ansley, in our life, in our family, in our future. We are yours. And I pray that for everyone here, Lord, that they would feel the stirring of their spirit and their soul like a burning flame, that it would just cause them to hunger and thirst for God and his will to take precedence and center stage in their lives. Only you can do that, Lord. Only your Holy Spirit can. Words of mere men cannot persuade us to live a life of surrender. I pray that your spirit would show us just how worth it it is and how worthy you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.